Good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue our study on Judges chapter 13. Yeah, but for, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time we have each morning to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence here as we once again look at um, the book of Judges and how it applies to our time. We pray for wisdom and understanding. We pray for your Holy Spirit to instruct each of us, to correct us, to reprove us. And we pray, Lord, that you can come close to each person in their day-to-day -day walk. We also pray for those who are having health problems, or those that are facing difficult times in various ways. We ask that you can watch over them and that we can minister to those around us. Be with us now as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, we were finishing off uh, yesterday. We kind of went, it was kind of a bit of a crazy morning. We went a little bit long because I was having trouble trying to find a file, which um, I have a copy of because... Ron sent me a copy of it, um, though, you know, I think we'll probably try to reconstruct that again, just, you know, briefly show you here. So this is just the, was the screenshot that he got from the video a few days ago. And we had put these um, periods taking judges <clears throat> and putting <clears throat> putting them on a line, and then we started addressing, uh, instead of doing that, we started addressing Judges 13 as a structural chiasm, um, which is, um, you know, was at Dwight's suggestion. And we can see that there is indeed um, a type of chiasm, and that chiasm uh, would relate to um, the knowledge that precedes, uh, or that, that the lack of knowledge about the character of Christ, the character of this person, prior to verse 13, and then afterwards a revelation of Christ. And then that's going to bring us to verse 23. And then we're going to have, as part of that, uh, the birth of, of Samson. And his name means sunshine, and he represents Christ. Um. So what we want to do is to draw this out in some way. So we, we will we'll go here and just have a start of a drawing. So that's what we were going to try to do yesterday uh, to get this drawn out. And, and we're going to do it here instead of on the whiteboard. Um, I got it on autosave. <laughs> so I won't lose it. Now, uh, this obviously is, we're not, um, uh, we're, we're not putting any dates here yet, right? So I have a date there. That's just from another diagram. So if we're going to take this, this line, so this is going to be Judges 13. What we want to do is we want to put these verses on a line. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So so here we're gonna have thirteen thirteen. Now thirteen thirteen, what is thirteen thirteen as far as the verse itself? What is it um describing? says, the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. And we have a doubling there, right, 1313. And of course, it is the number of rebellion. Yeah, it's the number of rebellion. And, and this is an ironic line. But this word beware, Hebrew 8104. Yeah would more properly to be guard or protect 
Right. Preserve, regard, save, wait, watch. It, it properly to hedge about as with thorns. Right? In other words, this is something that is important for this woman, the wife of Manoah, mm -hmm. the representative of the church, to pay attention to. Yes. Now, I'm just going to look this up. Yeah, so it's something that she has to pay heed to. That's that's the idea there that we're getting from just the definition of the word. Um, now, it's in the nifal form in Hebrew, which means to be on one's guard, take heed, take care, beware, keep oneself, refrain, abstain, to be kept, be guarded. Um, so yeah, so she needs to be on her guard. So that's what's occurring there. So what could this possibly mean uh, in the context of this line if we're putting it at the center? Would we say that we are to take heed, that we're to pay attention with this? That's well, yeah, but, but that's not what I'm, I'm talking about, though. That's not the question I'm asking. I'm asking, where does this go on a line? What is this 1313? Because this is a line. It's a zoom into some way mark on a line above it. That's, that's my understanding of what we're doing here with this line. But this line is not, because if we're going to put this as a line, it has to be a line that exists um, within um, within a way mark. Does that does that make sense? Okay, you made a point. Can you show an example of what you're talking about of how this would work? Well, this is what we've been doing, you know, throughout this study of understanding the lines. When we create a line, we're not. We're not just drawing a line that lines up with our line. That is, we don't. We have the line from 1989 to the Sunday law. That, that's basically the line of this movement from the beginning. That's the repeat of the first and second angels' messages. But we have all these other lines, and we don't just, we don't just lay them down over top of each other directly. We recognize that when we had, for instance, uh, the midnight cry as being given on October 13th, 2018, well, that, that wasn't just another line that we, we fit into the lines. It was actually a zoom into a way mark. So it was a line that was created. That, that date was created by zooming into some other line, to some way mark on another line. And so if we're going to take this line here of chapter 13, it must be illustrating some event on some line. That, that's how we've been approaching this. And so if we're going to, to put it somewhere, we have to give it a date. It, it has to be a way mark. <clears throat> See, and, and if we, we do this, the idea here is that we have uh, a structural chiasm doesn't mean it's it's chronological in every aspect, but it's but it's a chiasm, and we would have um, here 
we would have, you know, the name not no. Right? On this first half of this line. And then we would have the name no. Right. That's that's how I understand that we're we're doing this. And and so we would have to then say, well, this must be illustrating something in our history. Right? Because we have something that's not known, the name, and then we're going to have this name made known. And there is specific ways in which we would mark this. We just don't know what they are yet. And we were taking these first 12 verses as representing this history. And then the next 12 verses as representing this history with this verse at the center. Now, one of the things we've noticed about um, this line is that we, we do see November, or not November, right? Se September 11th illustrated in the line, right? In this, this chapter. So, you know, if we go back to this chapter and we look at it, the, the whole idea, at least from what I understood, is we have, this is all about the birth of Samson. So the birth of Sam Samson represents a revelation of Jesus Christ, but here in the ironic sense, and um, we have the angel of the Lord comes. We know we have these characteristics that are similar to, to Christ regarding this child. He's going to be a Nazarite. Um, she shall conceive and bear a son, right? So these are noticed by other people that Samson becomes a type of Christ. And, and this is sort of the preamble to the birth of Samson. But it must be illustrating some waymark on some line. And so the question is, what waymark is it illustrating? Um, would we have it illustrate, for instance, July 18, 2020? And if, and if we did, if we put July 18, 2020 here at the center, then we would have to illustrate what the name not being known and the name being known would have to do with July 18, 2020. So I'm not saying that it's that date. Does that make sense? If we were to look at this with July 18th being <clears throat> the center point, mm -hmm. we would have the name not being known prior to July 18th, the name being known after July 18th. Right. And it would be the process of that name being known unfolding, right? Right, exactly. It's a progressive message. Because we know that this is going to, when, we, when we've examined this with Samson, we know that Samson is going to be a message that is very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other points that we had looked at that we that we had discussed was that when in thirteen six seven verses before the center point, we have the woman that comes to tell her husband saying, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. So the question becomes, how does she know what an angel of God looks at, and why repeat Mare twice? 
Yeah, so the so the countenance part. Correct. Right? Yeah, cool. and yeah, so we see a doubling here. So we see all these symbols of the midnight cry. But we're all also before midnight. We're also seeing the symbols of Daniel eight thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we see symbols of Daniel 8.13. We know that there is, and in connection with his countenance, uh, neither, you know, she's not, she did not ask where he was from, and, and he did not tell her his name. Right. So there's these two aspects. Now, you know how we're going to to address this. You know, I'm not I'm not particularly particularly certain. Um, so I'm just I'm just going through this process here. Um, now, you know, we could do something like you know, well, I'm just going to do it since we have this here. We could you know put 2019 here, for instance. Um, we could say that this this line begins with 2019, November 9th. Now. It has the symbols of November 11th, but that doesn't mean that we need ne November 11th in this line, or not November 11th, September 11th. Doesn't mean we need September 11th in this nine to in this line number uh, 2001. I mean, there are different ways in which we could do this, so it's not like we. Um, it's clear to us right now exactly how we should do this. We, we need to understand what this is, at least in its basic structure, we can see that this is a reform line, a reform line that addresses uh, not knowing the name and knowing the name. And we know that this has to do with the character of Christ. We can see these symbols of dealing with um, the 2300 days, It's but isn't the, this isn't this yeah. a reform line for the movement? Yep. Yeah. So it's a reform line for the movement, but it it doesn't necessarily cover the entire history. But having the waymark beginning with November 9th. Yeah. So we're we're still dealing with 911 right there. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's that's all I'm saying here is I, I believe we have to have some kind of 9-11 or 11-9 at the beginning of this line. Because this line is, now, the other option we have is you could put, um, you know, 1989 here, or you could put September 11th here. I mean, but I would think that it begins with one of those three, right? There's three different ones we have to choose from that I believe the line has to begin with. Now, the time in the end is, is of course, you know, th that would be where our line begins. The point that you're making, though, is better if we begin this with 9th of November <laughs> 2019, because the message that is to be given the fact that this message has not arrived in this chapter, the mm -hmm. message that is to be given is to be a message of great strength. Mm -hmm. So far, this movement has not given a message of great strength. No. So the tie-in here with November 9th, I believe is correct for what we're trying to establish in this line. Okay. Yeah. And that's sort of, that's sort of my idea here of this line because it's illustrating September 11th, but it doesn't have to be actually September 11th. Right. 
because we already, know, we already know November 9th is connected to September 11th. We've, we've connected it different ways in, in the book of Judges. Um, we did that in the story of Gideon, for instance. So, so some kind of revelation is happening to this movement that begins with November 9th in this particular point having to do with the character of Christ. And, and we can see that November 9th, um, because it's representing 9-11, um, in this movement, there is an understanding that's unfolding that we don't have prior to November 9th. Now, normally we... You know, the other way I could have tried to look at this is the name not known is the period of darkness and the name known is the period of, you know, the increase of light and so forth. But I see this more as a chiasm. And since it's a chiasm, we, we never have the chiasm um, um, you know, have part of it as the period of darkness in the, right, so so this would always be part of a reform line. If we use the Millerites as the example, um, we have a period of darkness prior to November 9th, and, and we would have to figure out what that pe period of darkness is. Now, we have a revelation that happens on November 9th, but the name is still not known, but there still is a revelation. There still is an increase of light, Right. Because, I mean, really, we can put the name not known right at the beginning of November 9th, that we have this increase of light, a mighty, you know, an angel arrives, the first angel's message arrives, but it lacks something. And so it's it's giving this, this knowledge, and, and that's what we have to figure out that's being trying to be understood here in this story of Samson. Because, you know, we spent a lot of time on Samson. We understand the nature of, of Samson. But we really never addressed the significance of chapter 13. You know, not in the way that we're doing now. So, so we have this information. Now, this increase of light has to do with our message. So we know, what is it that we didn't know prior to November 9th. What is the darkness of November 9th, according to Judges 13? So Judges chapter 13 calls it what? Philistine oppression? Is that what it is? Right? Now, they're going to be put into the hand of, of the Lord for 40 years. And this 40 years then is going to be this entire history. Right. Of of Samson. So before we had this as a 40 years, but this can't be 40 years because this is just leading up to um, the birth of Samson. Right. So and this this is even preparing the woman before she conceives. They, or, or maybe she has conceived, I don't know, but it's talking about how she should live. And then she's going to bear a son and call his name Samson. So it doesn't tell us how long it is from when this angel appears to her. But we, we would assume that it's probably about nine months, maybe less, maybe more. But is, is that a good assumption to make? So we're making the assumption that this, this angel appears to her 
somewhat within a proper gestation period. Yeah. Yeah, okay. somewhere within there. So so you know this is not this is not illustrating this part is not illustrating the 40 years of oppression. It's illustrating uh, and and exactly where would we place the birth of Samson within that 40 years? Stephen, do you have any suggestions on that? Uh, well, Ellen White, she just says that uh, it was early and not Philistine oppression. So I take it maybe in the first couple of years. And and the Phillips, Philistine oppression at 40 years ends with what event? How are we ending that? Well, I would think it would end with the temple of uh, Dagon being destroyed. Yeah, so that would make Samson then roughly about 38 or something when he dies. Yes. Okay. Would it end with the temple of Dagon being destroyed or would it be, would it end with the ark being returned? Yeah, I don't know where that their story would connect with us. So there would be an issue there uh, how okay. to where to place that story of the ark in connection with Samson. It would be around yeah. that time. Not too you're, sure you're when. Say, now, are you saying the destruction of the Temple of Dagon that Samson does or the destruction that occurs when Dagon winds up be before the Ark? I'm talking about the destruction that Samson Okay. Does. Yeah, because how long would it be until uh, the Ark's returned? We don't, do we know? Did we figure that out? Well, the Ark has returned, of course, you know, right after the, the death or soon after the death of Eli and his sons. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I mean, we so we still have a, a a huge problem in that chronology that I haven't sorted out at least. Um, addressing how long it is after Samson that we uh, have Samuel. Right. So I, I don't think we can connect the, I mean, the 40 years Philistine oppression isn't, isn't a period that would be connected with Samuel, even though the Philistines are in that story. Right, Stephen? Yeah, that's, um, we know the Israelites and the Philistines were having, they were the sort of the main antagonists for them around that time. So, yeah, I, I haven't really worked it out. So maybe the idea there would be that they would rebuild this temple of Dagon sometime after that, and then the Ark would be taken and put into it. Or else the other idea is that the ark had been taken out of it by that time, and that uh, take, they're going to be set set up again, and then I don't know. So I I tend to more think it's sort of uh, the story of Samson is, is after that, you know, that's been rebuilt, and then the Philistines take it into the the temple, the ark. But I haven't really. I'm not sure. I don't know. I have to think about it a bit more. Okay, so it's just something we, we still haven't sorted out. I have, a question. I have okay. a question here. Um, it says in Strong's that um, Samsung or Samson ruled for ruled Israel or judged Israel for 20 years. Would that have any bearing on this? Well, yeah, because he, he doesn't obviously do that when he's born. So that's right. So he rules that basically 
somewhere around 18 years starts ruling. Is that how you understand it, Stephen? Yeah, somewhere around that age. Yeah. 18, or early 20 or whatever, around that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he, he's still considered being a judge even while he's captured by the Philistines, so so to speak, in that 20 years. We we don't know how long he's he's captured though for, right? No. No, so El might I think she says when he was in early manhood, he first had contact with the Philistines. So I'm yeah. thinking he's probably in sort of Late, late teens at that their time and then he he has that issue with the marriage and then he slays three thousand sorry he slays a thousand with the jawbone of an ass mm -hmm. and then he judge, judges for 20 years after that so i think yeah you would have to be sort of late teens probably before he uh begins that 20 years and that's why we have his um that 40 years of philistine oppression Samson's going to be born really at, at very much at the beginning of that. Right, so a year or two or whatever after that 40 years begins. Now, so we know also we have, they're delivered into the hand of the Philistines, right? And so, I mean, we could take this, um, this story then is maybe roughly in the first year or so of that philistine oppression right chapter 13 would fit into that period right it would have to right based on actually the this year philistine oppression could be actually connected with the 18 years of the Ammon, ammonite and philistine oppression so you're saying that they're, they're connected together like over i'm just thinking that could be a possibility okay yeah, so there's a, a, and that's why Judges is problematic. It, the chron chronology is kind of, there's things that are uncertain. They're not clearly marked out. But whatever this is, we're, I mean, we're not putting a year on when this began, but we do know that chapter 13 is within the first year or two of this Philistine oppression. That's marked as 40 years, right? And... Um, so when we look at um, verse 1 of Judges 13, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, barren not. So this would be at the beginning of this forty years. And that would fit with what information we have. I mean, it could be within you know, shortly after they are delivered into the hand of the Philistines, that we have this situation. Now, now, if we're doing that, you know, so if we're going to, if we're going to take this and now make a parallel with our history, um, we're taking that this Manoah is a message that relates. So before we were doing this, we were starting at September 11th. So in the other line that we were drawing, we were starting at September 11th. But now we're suggesting we could start at 9-11, that we could narrow the focus of this birth of Samson. Whether this is the correct way to do it or not, I don't know, but we could. And that we would take Manoah as representing the message that is inherited from Jeff. Right? This, this is a, me a message, and it comes from Bumblebee Road, right? He's this, There's a certain man, and this is not a person in our line. This is a message, but it's a message that's from Zora. Now, what about of the family of the Danites? What would that indicate? And, and how and could we mark a Philistine oppression that begins at um, on November 9th, 
family of the Danites, would that be of the 144,000? Because aren't the 144,000 to judge angels? Yeah, but it also could refer to the characteristic of, of this movement in its critical spirit. Right? That's what we talked about before. <clears throat> Quite possibly. Right. Dan is a backbiter. He's a judge. He's a critic. Right? And, and they're under Philistine oppression, and the woman is barren. And that would characterize this movement as far as the wife representing the church, the people, not, not the structure or the organization. So even though we have this message that comes from rest, right, from from the Sabbath, from the sabbatical rest of the land, from all these different things. And it comes from Bumblebee Road. You know, it's hornets here, but um, the same idea. And it's of the family of the Danites. So, so we have, this could characterize our message at the time of November 9th. And the problem with the message, the problem here is that God wants to deliver them, but there is preparation that's needed and, and a revelation of the character of Christ that's needed, right? Because the woman is barren. She's now going to take, have to take this, this uh, in a sense, she takes the vow in that she's not going to drink wine or strong drink or eat of anything that's unclean. So there's the strict uh, rules placed upon her in order to bear this child. So, I mean, I'm not 100% certain that we can, we can place it, but at least we can understand all of the symbols of it. And if we can understand the symbols, we can at least see a reasonable place to take this, this story. And we have been applying judges to, to our history from 9-11 to 2023. And maybe, maybe we have to do that. Maybe we have to go to, um, you know, September 11th. But, and that's where we were starting, you know, when we started to draw this out, that was the way that I looked at it. But I think with this um, chiastic structure, it suggests that it's something more focused in our history because we need this center of this um, to mark this difference between the name being known and the name, or name not being known and the name being known. Now, the one thing that we didn't uh, mark on our board really well was this word beware, um, because they do say it in verse four. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink and eat, uh, eat not any unclean thing. I mean, we did have it in connection with this these instructions, but we're going to have that beware repeated. Um where was that? In verse, the, verse six. Verse six. Okay, so. Let's see it in verse six. My apology. Um, so you've got <clears throat> verse four. And then verse 13. Okay, yeah. It, right, it was in verse 13. Okay. So this beware, um, 
and and this would fit in our idea that um, we're going to have the first, second, and third angel's message are, are tied up in the first angel's message. And, and if we were going to mark verse 13, this is going to mark um, the beginning of uh, the arrival of the second angel, right? If we're going to place it in history. All right, good. Okay. Now, which which is why I was su suggesting July 18th, because it's supposed to be um, connected to that. Well, depends how we look at it. So, I mean, it could be the midnight cry. There's different ways, different lines. It's different things. So, I'm not sure how to do this. Um, so, another thing about... Um, this this word beware um i mean it's it's most of the times it's actually translated as the word keep and it's just interesting that in the king james it occurs 186 times as the word keep whether that is significant significant or not as placing it because we know uh, 186 is the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So 186 also can represent 187. But of course, here in this context, it's translated as the word beware. And which is, yeah, translated nine times in the King James. So I don't know if that's a you know, something we should look at or not. But in verse 13, we have the doubling. And so we would put this as the second angel arrives if we're drawing it in a reform line. And it's going to repeat a certain aspect of the first angel's message. Because in the first angel's message, all three messages are contained, but this one is focused upon. Um, again, it's going to repeat these instructions. Um, So, so what, what do we think here? Any suggestions that people have? Because if I put July 18, so I'll put July 18 here. So if we have July 18, 2020 there, we would then have to figure out what this name not being known means and what it, the name being known means. Now, I'm not saying that we're correct here in this at all, but if, if we are correct, what would this mean? Because we know this has to do with Palmoni. And, and can we mark that, I mean, can we argue that we did, didn't understand Palmoni prior to July 18th? Could we argue that? I don't think we can argue that. Okay. I think we're coming to an, a, a greater understanding of Palmoni right now. But that's just an opinion. Well, definitely we are coming to a greater understanding. But the, I, mean, I mean, part of the problem that we have with the numbers uh, with the chronology, with, with prophecy even in general, is that people have a difficult time connecting that to the gospel, right? People see it as unnecessary. You know, the first time I present chronology at the School of the Prophets, well, it's not at the School of the Prophets, it, it's at FFA, at their camp meeting in 2014, people are walking out saying this is a waste of our time. You know, the question is, why, why would that attitude even exist 
within this movement? I mean, why does it exist within Adventism? As a question, mm -hmm. those that walked out saying it was a waste of their time, how many of those are yet within the movement? Well, I don't know because I didn't know anybody personally, but I would assume none of them. That's what I would assume as well. Yeah. No, but there, there's a reason. I mean, the question is, why, why is it that uh, Tom and I get such a bad rap? I mean, if we look at um, uh, Lewis F. Weir, if you've read any of his books, like uh, uh, that thick one on the third angel's message, I uh, um, can't remember the title of it, but, you know, it's, it's, he has all kinds of things in there about how to study God's word. And he definitely addresses how we deal with sim the symbolic use of numbers. And why it's important. And he gives all kinds of examples that Adventists would readily accept. That is, as Seventh-day Adventists, we do accept the symbolic use of numbers. Right? Is 666 a symbolic number? Of course. Yeah. Is, is the number 7 symbolic? The number 12? The number 70? Right? We can go through all kinds of numbers that Adventists accept as symbolic. And yet, we don't, when somebody uses numbers symbolically, we often accuse them of numerology, even though numerology is something quite different. It's the magical use of numbers, not the symbolic use of numbers. We don't, we don't attach any magic to numbers. We don't do, we don't take action based upon you know the number of the day well i'm not going to go shopping today because you know it's such and such a date and it adds up to such and such a number or it multiplies and creates such and such a number that's numerology changing your name uh so that you have a more powerful name in numero numerologically right that's numerology but recognizing the symbolic use of numbers in scripture in connection with prophecy is not numerology so, but yet, when it comes to Palmoni, in connection with our history, we had a whole group, people, primary people in the movement, leaders in the movement, leaving the movement, rejecting the symbolic use of numbers. Right. So, so the question is, you know, what is what does this mean? If we're going to say that this name being known and the name not known has something to do with Palmoni, uh, where would we place that? Where would we say the name is not known? And then we have a revelation, an increase of light regarding Palmoni. And how, how is this connected with the symbol of Samson in our movement? Why do you have July 18th in the middle? You think it be at I, the end. I, I just put it there as it just said, if, if the name not known is referring to uh, uh, something and not name known referring to something, what if I put July 18th in the middle, could we make this work? That's, that's all, that's the only reason I put it there. Even the November 9th, 2019 at the beginning is just, can we see, we're, we're doing some trial and error here. And, and, and the reason why I chose July 18th is it symbolizes the midnight cry. But, you know, we don't necessarily put the midnight cries at the center. We usually put, I mean, the other option is we do this. We take... Uh, November 9th, and we put it in the center. All right, so you can put November 9th here. And and then you have maybe even 9-11 over here. Right? And so if you have 9-11 over here, um, this is really Palmoni not being understood 
and November 9th makes Palmanai understood. And then you just simply have, uh, you know, this is the first day of the first month, right? And then you have something else that represents midnight, something else, the midnight cry, and something else, the Sunday law. Sunday law, you would connect here with, with the end of our line. So you take the 777 structure here and put it as the name being known. And this history here from September 11th to November 9th is the name not being known. That is, when it comes to the angel of the Lord, that is Pal Pal Palmoni, we don't know where he's come from. And we didn't ask him his name, or he didn't tell us his name. We didn't ask where he came from, and he didn't tell us his name. And so then we'd have to say that somehow Palmoni told us his name after November 9th. You understand what I'm doing. I'm not saying that either of these are correct. I'm just saying that that's, that's what we would have to decide. Because we believe that this name being known and not known has to do with Palmona. That, that I would be fairly certain of. And this would be necessary in order for Samson to be born. Now, it doesn't mean that the story of Samson follows after this, right? The story of Samson still can overlap lap this. Um, so Palmoni is Melchizedek. I don't know. I've never made that connection. I mean, well, obviously you were just saying we don't know where where he came from, and then I was thinking, having no father, like we don't know yeah. who his parents were or anything like that. Yeah, that's that. I understood where 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 you where you getting that from. I'd never never thought of that before in this context. <laughs> that just came to me too. So does that make sense to people? Because Melchizedek, we you know, he's not in the genealogies without father, without mother. Right. Could that be tying that symbol of Melchizedek? And if we're going to tie Melchizedek, what does Melchizedek represent? You know, spiritually, symbolically. And how would we tie that to Palmoni? And how would we tie it to this movement? I know it's a new thought. So. <clears throat> it would, it's something that, that is going to have to be looked at, but in the, in the bigger picture of what we have just been addressing, mm -hmm. If you go back to this situation where November 9th is the beginning and July 18th is the center. Yeah, okay. The, the situation that we have right now, as we are studying the symbols in this particular chapter, we know that there's a 40-year period of Philistine oppression, right? Yeah. Now, is the wife of Manoah oppressed in this 40-year period? Well, I don't know particularly. I mean, it doesn't mention. I mean, she seems to be. She's under Philistine oppression, so I guess she's oppressed. It doesn't show how it affects her life per se she is of she is of god's denominated people at that time so okay. is she is she as a symbol oppressed by the philistines yeah rosanna is that does that point make sense? I I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> here's here's what I'm trying to get at as far as symbols. A woman is a church. The church at this point is being oppressed. The vision 
comes to the woman, the wife of Manoah. This countenance, this mare vision, is giving a message to the church. Now, is that logical to everybody? Yes. Okay. Would it would that date be then Palmoni? When did we first discover Palmoni? We have been discovering Palmoni ever since we really delved into Daniel 8.13 and began to look to understand Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12. <clears throat> now, my question relates to this. Is the man that comes to the wife of Manoah, who we have, I, we have now identified as being Christ. Is Christ giving a message to the symbol of the church? Because if the, if a woman is a church, is Christ giving a message to the church. Yes. Okay. So my premise that I'm going to I'm going to present for this discussion. If this is a message to the church. Is this message that's being given under this time of oppression tied with the message that was given that we studied before in Ezekiel 8? And I'll be specific. Ezekiel 8, verse 2. Then I beheld... And lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire. And from his loins, even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. Every time that that word appearance comes in, we are dealing with the same word that is translated here in Judges as countenance. This is a mare vision. Then we have Ezekiel 8, 4, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Here again, vision, mare. When we look at the book of Daniel, the mare vision is also tied in with the 2300 days, the vision of the Arab Boker, the vision of the evening and morning, which was true. So all of these are messages to the church. That's my premise. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so, so I'm looking at something else here, just trying to understand this. So we have these 40 years of, of oppression. Now, with these 40 years of oppression, could they be parallel to uh, the wilderness wandering? Very easily. 
Okay. Now, a specific aspect of the wilderness wand wandering is the period of the manna, right? Very much agreed. Okay. Now, if we if we look at the period of the manna, it falls for 494 months. Right, from the first time it falls to the time they go out to gather it. It's going to be 14,588 days. Now, if we count from November 9th, 1989, from the end of that, we come to the beginning of the Day of Atonement in 2029, right? So remember, we have um, the, the first day of the first month is April 5th, 2030, right? So that's, that's the beginning of the, the religious year. The previous uh, year would begin on the 10th day of the seventh month if it was a Jubilee year, right? Does that, that make sense, what I'm saying? So I could just, I could illustrate it here. I'm tracking with what you're saying. Okay, right. So if I took November 9th, 1989, I'm just going to put it here. And I counted uh, 4,588 days, right, from the end of that. That's going to bring me to 2029. But it's going to be one, uh, one Hebrew month earlier. And so this would be... Uh, whatever it is, October 19th, 2029. And that would be a period of 40 years, right? Less a month. And if I went from, and I'm just going to do it here. I'm just going to wreck all this that we did. I can undo it. Um, and if I go from November 9th, November 9th, um, 2019, and I count, uh, well, I'll do it this way. I would count um, 494 weeks, right? So, so this is 494 months, this is 494 weeks. And this would bring me to uh, Passover in that Jewish year, right? So that would bring me to Passover in 2029, if I got this correct. Yeah, so that bring me to Passover. So again, if I count from the end of November 9th, 2019, and I count those weeks, you know, this would bring me to uh, Passover in 2029. Now, whether these mean anything or not, the, the, as far as dates, um, because I, I've dealt with this period of time here as, um, as marking out a end of a Jubilee cycle of some sort that's... Um, not really sure how to to address this, but but if this is uh, 494 months, and this is you know 494 weeks, it it becomes kind of interesting that the Passover in 2029 and the Day of Atonement in 2029 are marked out by using these November 9th dates. Now, I don't know how this relates specifically to what we're talking about, but it does tie the November 9th, 1989 to the November 9th, 2019, where in this diagram, we're trying, what, what, what I think we're seeing is we're seeing a, a zoom in to something in, in our message, in our history that relates to our whole history. That is, what ha what's happening to this movement now is somehow tied to what happened to the movement in the past. 
That is, we're repeating history to learn a lesson. Does that make any sense? I don't know how it relates specifically to the question or the comments that you're making there, Dwight. You have a point that's worth considering. Yeah, so so there must be some key that, that when we, we look at this whole thing, this whole puzzle, that it, it all falls into place. I, I'm not the type of person to sort of force things to fit one way or the other. Um, that's why we're, we're being open about how we're looking at this, because there isn't an obvious fit so far. But what, what we can try to say about this is that if we look at this movement as a whole, there has a, been a progression of the understanding of Palmoni, but only to a point. November 9th and the events connected with it really expand our understanding of the symbolic use of numbers. Correct? Right. But the, the real significance of it, it and, and I'm going to take this, this connection between uh, Melchizedek and Palmoni. I mean, we both know that they represent Christ. I mean, one is, of course, um, you know, Palmoni is Christ in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. And with Melchizedek, uh, Melchizedek comes into play um, in the history of Abraham. But it's in the book of Hebrews that we're going to read about Melchizedek in, in his uh, representation symbolizing Christ's priesthood. And, and what's the main difference that, that Paul sees? Why does he bring up Melchizedek as this example? What's, what's his whole point about Melchizedek? It's uh, about the new priesthood that uh, the Levitical priesthood's gone and it's yeah. been replaced by Christ. Right. So, so and, and, and he uses Melchizedek symbolically to show that since Abraham paid ties to Melchizedek, um, um, right, he says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. Right? So his argument regarding these tithes, um, in verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first by being interpretation kings of king of righteousness and also king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Right? So... Jesus is then for greater than Abraham, right? For in verse 10, 7 and 10 says, For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there of another that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? and not be called after the order of Aaron. So we can see that Melchizedek represents a priesthood order. Uh, um, and that, of course, comes from um, uh, the idea, thou art a priest forever. Oh. That's the, I know it probably has it here. find it
just can't find the verse. It's in Psalm 110, 4, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So, so that's that's what he's basing this on. Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? So this, of course, is... Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the Lord shall send a rod of thy strength out of Zion and rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So we can see that this, this is referring to Christ symbolically and allegorically. So what would that mean that 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 we have in this story of Judges, we have both this reference about he did not, I did not ask him where he came from and neither did he tell me his name. Can we tie this to, by tying together Melchizedek and Palmoni as symbols of something in our history? Right? So if we're going to do that, Right, if we're going to take Judges 13 um, and uh, verse 6, I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Right, so this is going to be the woman saying to her husband, what, what is it about these two characteristics, Melchizedek and Palmoni? Would we look at this as righteousness by faith and the chronology tied together? Prophecy tied together? That may be a very good point. Because that's kind of what we've been saying, isn't it? it, it isn't that really what uh, Jones has been saying in 1893 General Conference Bulletin. Isn't this what all of our studies are showing? That we can't just, we can't have the doctrine of Christ that is the 1919 uh, Bible Conference, that we're going to have this new literature, the books of a new order, that want to separate the story of Christ, the person of Christ from prophecy. And you can't have that. If we're going to understand Christ, if we're going to know Christ, if we're going to experience righteousness by faith, it's based upon understanding prophecy. Agreed. And prophecy relates to the individual, right? So so one of the things, you know, that we found in, in my simpler studies that I'm doing Friday afternoon with, with residents of the building here, um, is that, you know, we can very simply see the line, like in the story of creation, which is where we're at now, how it relates to our individual walk with God. But we can see in the story of the creation, we can see numerology, if you want to use that word, I, you know, sort of in quotes. I mean, because you have the seven days of creation, Right. You know, we, we have man's created on the sixth day. Six becomes the number of a man. Seven becomes this number of perfection. And we also understand that those seven days represent 7,000 years. So we have the symbolic use of numbers in lots of other ways, too, in, in the book of Genesis um, and in, in the creation of the world. But this is really about salvation. It's about God recreating us. It's about the gospel. And, and so the real problem that, that Adventists have when they're frightened of Palmoni, I mean, the real thing is they're frightened of the gospel, are they not? I think that they're frightened of the fact that the real gospel leaves them powerless because their power is derived 
from reliance upon their own strength or the strength of other men. And they don't like the idea that they're going to have to rely upon the strength of the creator. And hasn't this been what the lines have showed us? Haven't the experience that we've experienced in the lines? Because it's not just about a line that's some line in the future or some line in the past. It's actually a line that we're presently in. Right? Good. You can understand we're in this line. We've had an experience. And that experience is supposed to bring about a change of character, a realization, a uh, a revelation of Christ. And, and I don't think we really understand our spiritual condition. And, and the way I know that is because we focus upon the problems that other people have, not the problems that we have. So yeah, it's taking a bit of time to sort through this, but if we're going to um, if we're going to look at this, it's not just about um, not knowing where he came from or not knowing his name, but it's also not knowing where he came from. And why would that then be significant if we're going to try to understand our lines? So I just went back to here. Um, you know, and this is still just, we're working this through this. So this is the beginning of the 40 years symbolically. It doesn't literally have to be at the beginning of 1989. So I should put uh, 2019 here. So I'm, I'm going to do this, I guess. I'm just going to go 1989, 2019. Not that it's spanning that time necessarily, but that they're, they're parallel histories. And that in 2019, we are repeating, in a sense, a history. That is that period of darkness that preceded a November 9th, 1989, that comes with this increase of light. That we have, uh, instead of the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we have events connected to our movement. See, the one thing that, that this movement has liked to do, that it, it enjoyed doing, we put it that way, the people enjoyed doing, is pointing out the faults of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and how much better we are than them. Right? Not recognizing that what you're doing is basically being a Pharisee, right? Once you, once you point out that somebody else, that you're, you're better than someone else, you're, you're basically just putting a sign on your forehead saying you're a Pharisee, right? No disagreement. So, so this, this is the problem with this movement. It's the problem with Adventists in general. It's the problem with humanity. It's the problem with each one of us. We compare ourselves among ourselves, and we think that because we're better than someone else, and of course this is just our own assessment, doesn't even mean it's true in any sense, but it means that we're worse, that we don't understand our spiritual condition. And so this movement has to be paralleling this larger reform line like presently because we're tr we're trying to be able to go through this experience and learn the lesson that we didn't learn at the beginning and we can see then that manoah who's from noah who's from bumblebee road who's married to a wife that's barren that's of the family of the Danites. He's a judge. 
He's an accuser of the brethren. That's describing this movement, the message connected with this movement, the movement that has to be corrected. And the woman herself, she doesn't ask where this angel came from. She's not inquiring regarding the gospel, right? It's Melchizedek. It's the, the priest of the everlasting covenant that comes to her. And she doesn't even know where he came from, right? Correct. Okay. And, and he doesn't tell her his name, right? So she doesn't ask where he came from, and he doesn't tell her his name. And yet they're going to come to know his name before Samson can be born. Right. So if we can say that this movement comes to that point at November 9th, that God begins to instruct us in a particular way at November 9th. That is, we in a sense are repeating a reform line that this movement already had gone through in a larger scale. Um that this would have to be a zoom into some way mark. And to me, the way mark that characterizes that is July 18th. That was the purpose of July 18th, was to instruct this movement regarding the character of Christ through an understanding of these dates and symbols to show that he was leading us. And, and what it's done so far is it has revealed to us our character defects. July 18th should have done that. And so do we, we agree with that? So whether July 18 is the center of this structure, it doesn't have to be. Um, it, it could be the time at the end as well, but and and because I would like to at least I would like to have the center of the structure to be something that symbolizes the first day of the first month, or no, no, pardon me, the the um, the arrival of of the second angel, which is the first day of the first month in Millerite history. Right, so that's going to be, um, you know, so if we looked at Millerite history, this would be, um, this would be the first day of the first month, which July 18th wouldn't, would, we don't normally think of it as that way, Mark, but remember, when we zoom into a line, a date can take on different characteristics, that is, it can be a different part of a different line. So I don't, I don't know how to do this right now, we're going to still have to work through this. But do people see what we're getting at? A any more thoughts? I still think that a lot of what we're dealing with right here, we can tie right back to our studies in Ezekiel. Yes. Especially, well, especially with Ezekiel 8. Okay. Well, we can. Um, but we have to be, you know, quite clear in how we're doing that. I mean, see, so that's part of the problem with what we're doing, I guess, is what I should say. Um, so, I mean, Ezekiel 8 represents the problems with the church, right? That's how we've always applied it. It's the progressive destruction of four. Are we going to apply that to this movement? I mean, I don't know how we would do that. Well, all I am looking at at this point is 
<clears throat> that this helps us to understand that there is a message yet to be given to those that have remained within the church. Right. But right now we're not addressing that. We're addressing the problems in this movement. Right. So this movement obviously has to do that work. It's just that we are right now as a movement having to be prepared and the ultimate preparation will be to give first a message to the church and then to the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to have to come back to this. There's lots we're going to have to pray about. Lots that we don't understand. So, um, But I do think the Melchizedek Palmoni thing ties together. And we can all obviously see the priesthood aspect of, of this in, in this accepting of the offering, right? There's a symbol, symbolism there. But anyway, we will come back to this tomorrow. So let's, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful, even though we've had to struggle uh, through this study, trying to understand uh, Judges 13. We know, Lord, that you've given us insight, that you've guided us. Um, but we pray, Lord, that you can help us to continue to unfold this history history of the past and to connect it to the present so that we can understand our present duty. We pray for this movement. We pray for the decisions that we're making. And we ask, Lord, that we can glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.